Arrays are incredibly useful because they are a special type of data structure that allows us to store and manipulate a collection of values within a single object. But with their specialness also comes quite a bit of confusion because after all, they are very different than other types of data structures. And that's okay, we've all been there. And now I'm here to help. Hi, I am Jeremy McPeak with Envato Touch Plus, and I invite you to spend the next hour with me as we walk through some of the key features, concepts, and abilities of JavaScript arrays. In this course, you'll learn the primary mechanisms that we use to iterate and process arrays, how to sort them, search them, copy them, and manipulate them. Now, before we begin, be sure to like and subscribe the Envato Touch Plus channel. And now, let's get started. We are going to begin by looking at some of the basics. Now, chances are you already know this stuff and feel free to skip over the content that you feel like you need to skip over. But if you feel like you need this little refresher, then great. If you are brand new to arrays, this is going to be a very fast crash course. And really, I would recommend you look at some of our other JavaScript content. We have many tutorials and courses that would actually serve you a lot better because it would go more in depth at a much slower pace. However, if you want to stick around, then great. It's nice to have you. So let's begin by creating an array of numbers. Now we can do that by calling the array constructor, but you will typically never see that because just about everyone creates an array by using array literal notation, which is just a pair of square brackets. And whenever you create an array, it is empty by default, but you can pre-populate that with any values that you might already know. So this is going to be an array of numbers. Let's start with one, two, four, and eight. So we now have an array called numbers. It has four items or four elements, and we can access those elements by using the index notation. Indexes are just the positions of those values. So the index begins at zero. So at index zero is the value of one, at index one, it's two, at index two, it's four, at index three, it's eight. So if we wanted to access the value at index of three to get the value of eight, then we would use index notation, which is simply just the name of the array followed by a pair of square brackets. And inside of the square brackets, we have the index. So let's write this out to the console. And we can see that over on the right-hand side, we will see the value of eight. There it is. So that's all well and good. But let's say that we need to add some more values to this array. Well, we can do so in several different ways. The first is to use index notation. So the next index would be four, and we can simply assign our numeric value at the index of four. So this is putting the value of 16 at the end of the array. And if we write this out to the console, we will see that is indeed what happens. So the first version of the numbers array has four elements. After we add the value of 16, we now have five elements. But a lot of times you don't know how many elements there are in the array, and you just want to add an item at the end of that array. Well, we have a method that easily does that. It is called push. The idea is that you are pushing a value into the array. So here we're going to push the value of 32, which is going to add that value at the end of the array. So if we take a look at this in the browser, once again, we see the first two versions of the array, but then we have the array that now has six elements. And we can see that the value of 32 is at the end. But sometimes we want to insert a value at the beginning of the array. And we can do that using the unshift method. We simply pass in the value that we want, which in this case is going to be the value of zero, and that is going to insert that value at the beginning. So let's once again write out our numbers array to the console, and we will see that it changed. We now have seven items within this array. The first item is zero, then one, two, four, eight, 16, and 32. Now, if we can add items to an array, then it goes without saying that we can remove items as well. And one of the methods that we can use is called pop. 
So this is essentially the opposite of push. Push is we pushed a value into the array. Pop is we are popping a value off. And in fact, it's going to pop off the last element in the array. So we can store this within a variable. I'm going to call it simply last number. And we will call numbers.pop. That's going to pop off that value, which is the value of 32. So let's do this. We are going to write out the numbers array. Then we are going to write out the last number variable so that we can see that that value is 32. So let's refresh the browser. We can now see that our array does not have the value of 32 because we popped it off and we stored that inside of the last number variable. So there we go. So push allows us to push a value into the array at the end of the array. Pop lets us pop that value off. And if we can use the unshift method to insert a value at the beginning of the array, well, then we have a method called shift, which does the opposite. It takes the first element in the array and removes it from the array. But we can also store this in a variable. So let's once again write out our numbers array to the console. Let's also write out the value of first numbers so that we can see what that is. Let's refresh the browser and there it is. We have our array with five elements now because we removed the value of zero. We stored that within the first number variable and then we can use that value whenever we need to. Now about the only way that we can remove an item by its index is by using the splice method. For right now, we just want to remove a single item. So let's say that we want to remove the element at index four, which is the value of 16. That's what we added using the index notation. So the splice method actually lets you remove one or multiple elements within the array. But since we only want to remove one, we need to specify that. The first thing that we need to pass to the splice method is the index of where we want to start removing. And then we need to specify how many items do we want to remove. In this case, it's just one. We want to remove that one value of 16. So after we call splice, we can write out our numbers array to the console. And then finally, we will be back to our original version where we have four elements, one, two, four, and eight. Well, in the next lesson, we will take a look at some of the basic loops so that we can iterate and process arrays. In the previous lesson, we looked at the very basics of arrays. We talked about how to create them, add items to them, and remove items from them. In this lesson, we are going to continue looking at the basics, and we will look at the two most common loops, the for loop and the while loop. And what I want to do is create a shopping list. As you can see over on the right-hand side of the screen, there is already some text for a shopping list. And if we look at this HTML, we have a UL element that has an ID of list. And basically, I want to take the items inside of the array that we are going to create. And I want to create li elements. So uh, let's say that we want to make breakfast. So we need to get some milk. We need some butter and some bread and some eggs and all of that stuff. So the end result is going to be an unordered list that has li elements for of course, the things that we need to buy. But of course, we're going to generate those using JavaScript. So let's start by creating this list array. Uh, we want some milk. We also need some eggs. Let's get some butter for the bread that we are going to make for toast. And then of course, we need some bacon. And for each one of these strings, we want to create an li element so that we can display that in our list. And we do that by using a loop. Now, this is one of the reasons why we have arrays. It is a collection of things that we can work with very easily. We can process them using the same code. And that's what a loop does. It executes the same code for every item inside of an array. And probably the most common loop is the for loop, which has four parts to it. The first is the initialization. The second is the condition. The third is the increment. And then the fourth is the code that's actually going to execute. So the initialization is 
typically used for initializing a counter variable, something that we can use to keep track of the index of the item that we are currently working with. So let's do that. We'll create a variable called index, and we want to start the loop at the very beginning of our array. So index is going to be zero. Now, if you're looking at other people's code, they might use the variable name of i. That's very common. I use ii, because if I need to search for my counter variable, well, there's not many words that have two consecutive i's. The same can't be said for just i, because, well, list has an i, milk has an i, and there's a lot of of i's that you find in your code. So I use ii, but let's use index because that is exactly what we are going to be doing. We're going to keep track of the index. Now, the second part, this condition, this determines if the loop executes or if it exits. So if it's true, the loop executes. <laughs> Never use true here, uh, but if it's false, then of course the loop will exit. So we want to execute our loop for every element within our list array. So that means index needs to start at zero for milk. We need to change index to one so that we can work with eggs. Then the index needs to be two to work with butter and so on and so forth. But we only want to work with the amount of items inside of this list. So one thing we could do is say that as long as index is less than five, because we have five elements, and remember that since we start the index at zero, by the time we get to bacon, that is index four. So if we get to index five, then we want to exit the loop. However, we don't want to hard code our limit here because if we ever decide to add some sausage, because, well, if you're gonna have bacon, you might as well have sausage. Well, then we also have to come to the loop and we have to change our limit here. So instead, what we can do is use the length property on our array. That's going to return the length, which is, as it happens, the limit of our array. And anytime we add a new element to the array, well, let's get some juice, then that length is going to change. And then finally, the increment. We want to increment our index every time the loop executes. That's how we know if our index is less than the length of our array. All right, so we simply want to generate some HTML. So let's do this. Let's create a variable called HTML. We'll start it off as an empty string. And then what we will do is get our unordered list elements. I believe the ID was simply list and we will set the inner HTML equal to that HTML. So that inside of the for loop, all we need to do is just add a new li element to our HTML string. And since we have just simple strings, we can say list and then use index notation to get the item at that given index. And there we go. So if we save this, let's go to the browser and refresh. There we have our list of things. Perfect. But most of the time, we aren't working with simple values. We are working with more complex values like objects. So I'm going to paste in some objects. These objects have three properties. The first is the text. That's what we want to display in the browser. The second is the cost, because it would be nice to actually show the cost of the item so that if we have a budget, then we can at least say, oh, okay, this list is going to be you know, roughly 30 something dollars. And then later we will talk about this need property. Let's ignore that for now. So let's go to our HTML. Let's add a span element to this H2 so that we can output the cost here. And let's just give this an idea of cost. So that's going to work fine. Let's go ahead and set up that so that we output that value. And we will put a dollar sign before it. Uh, let's have a running total. We will just call it total, why not? 
And so let's create that total variable. We will initialize it as zero. And so now if we refresh the browser, we should see zero. But notice now that we see object object. Well, that makes perfect sense because we are no longer working with just simple strings. We now have objects. So whenever we want to output the text, we have to use the text property. So let's refresh. And there we go. So we can make our lives a little bit easier inside of the loop by creating a variable, we'll just call it item, and we will get the element at the given index. And then we can just use this item variable to reference the object that we are currently working with. So this makes it a little bit easier to process all of this information. So now we want to process the cost and we will simply take each item's cost and add that to our running total, which uh, that variable name is called total. So with that in place, we can refresh and voila, we have our shopping list. We expect it to be $34, but well, money's tight right now. So let's say that we have a budget of $30. Well, okay. And that's where this need property can come into play. Yes, it would be nice to have milk, but we don't really need that for our breakfast. So we need to include that as we are processing the array inside of the for loop. So let's just add an if statement. If we need that item, then we will output that item to our list and we will calculate the total there. Otherwise, we just ignore that. And whenever we run this in the browser, we are going to see our total changes. We are now under budget. We're at 25 bucks, which that's good. Saving money is always great. And we have our eggs, bread, and bacon. So there we go, that's the for loop. Now, another common loop is the while loop. So let's take a look at that. We will essentially do the same thing, such as outputting information. We will also take into account all of the other information about our shopping list, but we will use the while loop. Now, the while loop has just two parts to it. It has the condition, which once again, it will determine whether or not the loop is going to execute. And then the second part is the code that will execute. So this particular loop is very easy to get into an infinite loop. If you have a condition that is always true, you are going to have a rough time. But let's essentially do the same thing that we did for the for loop, but we will use the while loop. So that as long as we have an item to work with, then we can work with that item inside of our loop. So let's copy and paste our code, at least for checking if we need that item and then processing that item. But that in and of itself isn't going to work because as it is right now, we haven't done anything with this item variable. It doesn't even exist. So let's start by creating that item variable and we will uh, initialize that as the first item within our list. But be very, very, very careful here because as it is right now, our code doesn't change item one bit. And actually this code won't work because we don't have that index variable, but that's easy enough to do. So we initialize index as zero. We get the first item in the list. We use that as the condition for the while loop. But since we never change the value of item, we are in an infinite loop. We could go over to the browser and refresh this, but I, no, I'm not going to because we wouldn't really see anything because the loop would never exit and we would never execute this code here. So instead, what we can do inside of this while loop is set a new value for item to where we will once again use index notation, but we will increment index here. So the concept is very similar to what we did in the for loop. It's just organized in a slightly different way. All of our initialization stuff is done outside of the loop. We rely upon the condition to determine whether or not the loop will execute. We do the loop, but then we need to change whatever values we've used inside of the condition. Otherwise, we would end up with an infinite loop. But if we save this, we go to the browser and refresh, we can see that we have the same exact result. And if we decide that, hey, money's great, we don't need to worry about our budgets, we can comment out the code for determining if we need that item. And if we refresh, we have a bug uh, because we initialized the item as the first element in the array. Now, what we could do 
is organize this a little bit differently so that instead of just using item for our condition, we could use the assignment of item. And then whenever we create the item variable, we just won't initialize it. That gives us a little bit cleaner code. And so now if we take a look in the browser, we can see we get the correct results. And once again, if we needed to factor in our budget, we could just uncomment that code, refresh, and we have our condensed shopping list. Let's continue this discussion on iterating arrays, because while the for and while loops are useful, a lot of times we just want to iterate the array so that we can work with the individual elements. We don't necessarily care about the index or anything like that. And we certainly don't wanna go through the rigmarole of setting up a traditional for loop or priming up a while loop. So there are essentially two different ways of just iterating over an array. The first uses the for each method. This takes a functional approach because you pass a callback function to the for each method. And this callback will execute for every element in the array. So this callback function has three parameters. The first is the most important. It's the item or the element that you want to work with inside of the array. The second parameter is the index. So if you need the index, then that is a perfect way of getting that. And then finally, the third is the array itself that you are working with. Now, of course, you can use all of those that you want, but typically you just want the item. So I'm gonna make this a little more concise so that it's a little bit easier to read. So I'm going to use an arrow function. And so just this alone, we now have access to the item that we want to work with. We don't have to create that variable or anything like that. Don't have to prime anything. It's just given to us by default. So we can take the code from our while loop and we can just paste that inside of the callback function for our for each. And whenever we run this in the browser, we are going to see the same exact results. Perfect, that's what we want. Most of the time, this is what we want to do, just iterate over the array. However, once again, if you need access to the index, just get the index as the second parameter for your callback function. Now we can make this a little easier to read by destructuring this item parameter. We need the text property, the cost, and the need property. And then inside of our callback function, we can just refer to those individual values. We don't have to have item dot in front of them and everything is going to work just as it did before. So great, perfect, awesome. However, if you don't want to use the for each method because it does require a, a little bit of different thinking because it is functional programming, we do have another version of the for loop. It's called the for of loop. And it looks like this. We start with four, but instead of having an initialization, a condition and all of that stuff, we create the variable that we want to work with the individual item here of, and then the name of our array list. So for each item of our list, we want to essentially do the same thing that we did with the for each loop, but you know, we can destructure this as well. So if we just need the text and the cost, that's great, we can do that, but we also need need. And then this gives us a quick and easy way of just iterating over that array as well. So let's comment out our for each and let's refresh and we get the same exact result. Now, if for some reason we are using the for of loop and we need to access the index, we have to do a little bit more work because it's not going to give us the index by default. So instead what we can do is call the entries method on the list. Now this is going to return an iterator. An iterator is a special kind of object that produces a sequence of values. In this particular case, the sequence of values is a set of key value pairs. The keys in this particular case are the indexes, and then the values are the individual items or the individual elements that we want to work with. And these key value pairs are actually inside of another array. The first element 
in this key value pair array is the index. The second is the value. So it's a little more confusing. And really, if you need access to the index, I recommend using something other than the for of loop because the for each loop is perfect for that. It gives it to you out of the box by passing it as an argument for your callback function or use the traditional for loop. But still, we've started down this path. Let's finish it. So we could do this. We can destructure this so that we have the index and then we have the item. But also we want to destructure the item. So we will do that as well. So now we have access to the index if we need that. So uh, let's output the index of each one of these items whenever we output the text so that in the browser we can refresh the page. We can see the indexes for those items in the list. Again, while this works, if you need the index, use something other than a for of, just because it takes everyone's brains a little bit longer to decipher this code to understand what's going on, and you are typing a lot more than you would need for the for each method. So keep it simple with the for of. In fact, I'm going to back out those changes so that we don't have to see them. In the next lesson, we will talk about sorting arrays. Sometimes you just want to sort an array, especially if you plan on displaying the contents of that array to the user, because we humans are very simple. We like things in order. So JavaScript makes it very easy to sort in ascending order. All we need to do is call the sort method, and that's it. Now, this is a destructive method. This changes the array. So this doesn't create a copy that is sorted. This actually changes the order of the elements. So as I've defined this list array in eggs, butter, milk, bread, and bacon, whenever we call the sort method, we are going to see that it is sorted in ascending order, bacon, bread, butter, eggs, and milk. Now, JavaScript does not have a method for sorting in descending order. However, we can get a descending ordered array by calling sort and then simply reversing it. And in the browser, we can see that it is indeed in descending order. Now, the only reason why this works is because the reverse method, it doesn't do any sorting. It just simply reverses the array. So what is the first element becomes the last element. What was the last element becomes the first element. So if we take a look at this in the browser, you know, we can see that the original order is eggs, butter, milk, bread, bacon. In the reversed order, it is bacon, bread, milk, butter, and eggs. So of course, if you want descending order, then just sort it and then reverse it. But that is a little inefficient from an execution standpoint. It would be better to just sort it in descending order. And we can do that because we can pass a callback function to the sort method. Now, this callback function is a comparison function. It is going to accept two elements from the array, and we are supposed to compare them. We need to return one of three values. We need to return zero, which typically means that A is equal to B, which also means that there is no change because if A and B are equal, then there's no reason to change their order. They're equal. So there's no change if you return zero. Now you can return a negative value, but we typically just return negative one. This typically means that A should be sorted before B. And then the only other value is a positive value, which once again is just usually one. And that means that B is sorted before A. So those are the values that we need to return. So if we want to sort our array in descending order, it would look something like this. We will start off with our easiest comparison uh, because if it's equal, then we just return zero. But if A is greater than B, well, that means that we want A to come before B because we are sorting in descending order, which means that we need to return one there. Otherwise, we just return negative one because that's the only other thing that we can return. So with this in place, we should be able to refresh in the browser and no, that is sorted wrong. Oh, because my logic is wrong. 
<laughs> if A is greater than B, then we want A to come before B, which means that we need to return negative one. That was my fault. So there we go. Now, whenever we refresh, we see that it is in descending order. So perfect. Of course, if we wanted it in ascending order, well, there would be no reason to pass a callback function unless if you were working with something like an array of objects. So let's take a look at that because in most cases, we're working with objects as opposed to just simple values. So we have a second list. I'm going to just call it list two. This is our breakfast stuff. And let's say that we want to, first of all, sort by the text property. Okay, we can do that very easily by just using the text property inside of our comparison. So we're going to compare A text to B text. And of course, we need to change which array that we use here. But other than that, that should work. Although whenever we call for each, uh, let's do this. Let's extract out the text so that we can see that within the browser. So once again, we see our sorted array in descending order. But let's say this, let's sort our items by cost so that instead of text, we do so by cost. So that should be easy enough to do, but let's make this in ascending order. So this means that if A is greater than B, then we need to return one, otherwise we return negative one. But we also need to display the cost so that we can easily see if it is correct or not. So let's add cost to our output. And we should see our array sorted in ascending order based upon cost, and we do. And of course, if we wanted this in descending order, we could just flip this comparison, and that will change the sort order to be in descending order based upon the cost. So if your array is simple values, then using the sort method can be very simple. But of course, the more complex the data is, the more complex your sort callback function is going to be. But of course, the fact that you can provide a callback function means that you can sort your data however you need. Over the next couple of lessons, we will talk about searching arrays because, you know, remember, an array is just a collection of things. And sometimes we want to search an array for an index of an item, or we need to find an item based upon a certain criteria, or sometimes we just need to know if an item exists within an array. So in this lesson, we will talk about finding the index of an item within the array. And there's really three methods that we can use to do that. The first is called index of, and as its name implies, it is going to return the index of an item that you provide. Like for example, we have a list of just simple values, and let's say that we want to get the index of the item that is butter. So let's write this out to the console. We will pass butter to the index of method, and it will return, let's see, that is index two. So over in the console, we should see the value of two, and we do. If we change it to bread, then we should have the index of four because bread is at the index of four. So it's a very easy and straightforward method. But what happens if you try to find an item that does not exist within the array, like sausage? Well, that returns negative one, which makes perfect sense really because you know an index can be zero or a positive integer. So really the only thing that can denote an invalid item or at least an item that does not exist within the array would have to be a negative value. So negative one is what index of will return. But let's look at this. Notice that we have bacon twice inside of this array. We have it at index of zero and then index of, what is that, five? Yes, I believe five. So let's see what happens if we find the index of bacon. Well, in the console, we see the value of zero, which also makes perfect sense because the index of method is going to search an array starting at index zero. And it's going to search the array until it finds a match or until it gets to the end of the array. So in our particular case, we want to find the index of bacon. Well, it found bacon on the very first element. So it stopped searching because it found a match. So we get the value of zero. But what if we want to find this second occurrence of bacon? 
Well, we can pass in a second argument to the index of method, which is the starting index of where we want to start searching. So if we start searching at index one, well, then the value that index of returns is going to change because it's going to start searching at eggs and then it's going to search through to the end of the array. So we get the value of five. Now, an alternative solution would be to use the last index of method, which almost works exactly the same, except that it starts searching at the end of the array and it searches towards the beginning. So if we use last index of and pass in bacon, since it starts searching at the end, we are going to see the same value, five, because that's where it started searching. So index of and last index of are very, very easy methods. It will return negative one if it cannot find the item that you are searching for. Otherwise, it returns the index of that item. Now, one thing of note is that index of and last index of work best with very simple values. If, for example, we have strings, if you have an array of numbers, index of and last index of is going to work very well. But what if you have a more complex value like an object? So I'm going to paste in an object. We don't necessarily need the need property, so let's get rid of that. And let's say that we want to find the index of this particular object that has a text of bread and a cost of three. Well, we can try to use the index of method. However, here's the thing. An object is a reference value. It is a reference in memory. So if we take this object and we pass that same object, well, it's not really the same object. It looks like the same object we are going to see negative one in the console. And the reason is because that according to JavaScript, these are two completely separate objects. What we have inside of the list array and what we pass to the index of method looks exactly the same, but they are two different references of memory. So instead what we can use is a method called find index which gives us the ability to pass in a callback function. And it is going to use that function to try to find whatever it is we specify. So we want to find the object that has the text of bread. So that could look like this. We would have a callback function to where we work with the individual item. And we simply want to find the item that has bread for its text. The return value of this callback function needs to be a Boolean value. If it returns true, then the find index method has found the item that we are searching for. If it's false, then it's not. It's going to continue searching through the array. So if we take a look at this in the browser, it changes. Now we can see that our object that has the text of bread is at index six. And of course, we could simplify this using an arrow function. So let's do that. So when it comes to finding the index, we essentially have three different methods that we can use. The index of and last index of methods are useful for simple values. The find index method is useful for objects or reference value. In the next lesson, we are going to talk about the find method, which is somewhat similar to the find index method, except that it allows us to search an array for an actual item so that we can retrieve that item. Sometimes we just need to find an element in the array. We don't need the index or anything like that. We just need to find an element so that we can work with that element. And the arrays find method does just that. Now, this is a lot like the find index method that we looked at in the previous lesson, in that we provide a callback function that is going to test each element in the array. And this function needs to return a Boolean value. If it's true, then, well, we found that item, and so the find method is going to return that item to us. If not, then it's going to keep testing all of the elements until it reaches the end, at which point we don't find anything. So here we have our list of things. These are more complex objects, which the find method is perfect for because our little testing function gives us the ability to test whatever we need to test. So let's say that we want to find the item that has the text of eggs. 
Well, we can do that. Our testing function is very simple in that case because all we need to do is check the text property. If it's eggs, then great. We then have that item that we can work with so that in the console, we will see that object. We successfully retrieved that object. We can see the cost if we need it. And of course the text. What happens though, if we don't find a match? Like for example, if we try to find an element that has a text of sausage, well, that object of course does not exist. So undefined is returned to our variable, which makes sense because we aren't dealing with indexes or anything like that. So getting a value of negative one, like we did in the previous lesson, doesn't make much sense. We didn't find anything. We don't have a value to work with, so therefore it is undefined. But let's say that we need something a little more open-ended. We don't necessarily want to look for an item that has an exact text. Let's just say that we want the first item that has a cost less than five. Well, our function would look something like this, to where the cost would be less than five. And once again, it's going to search the array starting at the beginning, and it's going to test each one of those elements until it finds a match, at which point it's going to return that. So uh, according to our costs, that should be the item of milk. So let's run this in the browser. And sure enough, that's what we get. That is the first object that had a cost less than five. Now, one of the great things about the find method is that while it seems very suited just for objects, that's not necessarily the case. We can use it for any kind of value. So for example, I'm going to paste in an array of numbers, five, nine, 23. If you notice, uh, pretty much all of them are odd numbers, except for one, 54. So let's say that we want to find the first number in our numbers array that is even. Well, we can do that very easily by using the mod operator. So if the value mod two is equal to zero, then we have an even number. So if we output this variable to the console, we should see the value of 54 because that is the first and really it's the only value inside of our numbers array that is even. So it doesn't matter what type of data that you're working with, the find method is very useful if you need to find an element based upon certain criteria. We've talked about finding an index of an element. We've also talked about finding elements themselves, but sometimes you just need to know if an element exists inside of an array. And JavaScript gives us several methods that we can use to do just that. All of these methods return a Boolean value, true if the item exists, false if it doesn't. And we will begin with the most simple method. It's called includes. And I say that it is the most simple because you would typically use this with the most simple kinds of values, like strings or numeric values. So in that sense, it's a lot like the index of and last index of methods. However, there are some times when you would want to use it with a reference value, but those particular times are really up to you if it fits your use case. So here I am calling includes on our numbers array. We're going to see if the value of 23 can be found. And of course it is because it is defined as the value at index two. But let's see if the value of 24 is there. And of course that is not, so it returns false. So <laughs> it's a pretty simple method. Now, if you need a little more flexibility, then we can use a method called sum. The idea being that we are going to check if at least some of the elements in the array meet a certain criteria. So here we are going to use our list of objects and we're going to call sum. And let's say that we want to see if there are some items within this list that are needed. You know, so we have that need property. So we would pass in a callback function that would test each element in the array. Well, actually it doesn't test each element. If it finds an element that passes our test, then it is going to just automatically return true because in that particular case, some of the elements do meet that criteria. So here we will check if an item is needed. And of course we are going to see the value of true because we do have some items that are needed. 
But let's do this. Let's set all of the items as false, just so that we can see that whenever we refresh the page, we can see that the returned value of the sum method is false. But even if just one is true, then the return value is going to be true. So we can provide a callback function that will test to see if an item matches that criteria. And then the third method is somewhat similar, except that it will return true or false based upon if every element in the array meets a certain criteria. So let's go back to our numbers. And let's say that we want to see if every number in this array is an odd number. To do that, we simply call the every method. Once again, we pass in a callback function that will test the elements in this array. And we can determine if a number is odd using the mod operator. If it is not zero, I guess that's what we ought to check for, then that would mean that the number is odd. So let's refresh the page. We're going to see that it is false because we do have one even item. But let's change that to an odd numeric value. Let's refresh the page and we see that it flips to true because every value inside of the numbers array is odd. And so by using the includes, sum, and every methods, you can determine if an element exists in an array. Eventually, you will want to merge multiple arrays into a single array. And JavaScript gives us the tools that we need to concatenate or merge multiple arrays. Now, I use that term concatenate specifically because we have a method simply called concat, short for concatenation, and it does what you would think it does. It concatenates multiple arrays into a single array. Now, this does not modify any existing array. This creates a brand new array that contains the original array that we start with. In this case, I have two arrays, one called odd, one called even. So I'm going to start with the odd array, and we are going to concatenate the even array with odd. This will give us a new array, which I am storing in the numbers variable, and we can write that out to the console. In fact, let's do this. Let's write out the odd, even, and the numbers array, just so that we can see that the original arrays are still intact without any modification. And of course, our new array contains all of those values. So the first two arrays are, of course, the odd and even. Everything is the same there, but let's take a look at our new array, the numbers array. We have all of those values, but also notice that they are in the same exact order that they appeared in their original arrays. So we started with the odd array. So the first few values are from the odd array. We concatenate the even array and those appear afterwards and they are in the same order. But let's say that we have a third array that we want to concatenate with those. And let's just call this letters. So we will have a few string values to represent individual letters. And then we will pass letters as a second argument to the concat method. And that's all that we need to do. It is going to concatenate all of those arrays into a single array. And just like before, all of the values are going to be in the order that they appeared in their original arrays. So once again, we have the odd, we have the even, and now we have the letters array. But now we can take a look at, well, it's no longer numbers, is it? But we can see that once again, we have the values from the odd array. We then have the values from the even array, and then we have the values from the letters array. So it's a pretty simple thing to do just to call the concat method. Now we can also merge multiple arrays by using the spread operator. So let's do the same thing, except let's call this alpha numeric because that is exactly what it is. And all we have to do is just create a new array and we will spread out the odd, the even, and the letters array. So we essentially end up with the same exact type of array, but now it's a bit more declarative than using the concat method. And if we take a look at the output, of course, the first three arrays are the same. We haven't changed those, but our alphanumeric array has the same values in the same order 
that the concat method gave us. So when you need to merge multiple arrays, you have two options. You can call the concat method, or you can use the spread operator. Of course, there will come a time when you want to copy an array. And JavaScript gives us the slice method to do just that. We simply call the slice method on whatever array that we want to copy, and that is going to create a copy. Now, the name slice is a misnomer to me because it makes me think that I'm slicing out things into another array, and that's not the case. It doesn't modify the existing array at all. It just copies it. So we're going to start by this. We're going to copy the entire array. And let's first of all, write out the copied array to the console. We are going to see we have those five items. But let's do this now. Let's see if the copy array is the same array object as list, you know, kind of like we would have two variables that reference the same thing. Well, I can go ahead and tell you that that is not the case because whenever you call the slice method, it is going to create a brand new array. It's just going to contain the same things. And that there is key because since we are dealing with objects, these are reference values. The slice method doesn't create a copy of these objects. Since these are references, the references are copied to the new array. So what we end up with are two arrays that contain the same references. So you can get yourself into trouble if you copy an array and you think that you are working with different objects. Now, values, on the other hand, you know, simple values like strings, numbers, Boolean, you don't have to worry about that because those are values. They aren't references. If you're dealing with objects, then you have to worry about it. Now, let's say that we want a shorter copy. We don't want to copy the entire list array. So that's where the arguments that we pass to the slice method come into play. The first argument is the index of where we want to start the copy. So let's say that we want to copy bacon, eggs, and butter. So our copy will begin at bacon, and we want to copy the next three items. So we pass in the number of items that we want to copy, not the ending index of what we want to copy to. This is the number of elements that we want to copy. So in this particular case, this is going to give us a new array that contains just bacon, eggs, and butter. So let's refresh. We see we have that new array with those three items. And that's it. The slice method is very straightforward. The key thing to remember is that it doesn't change the existing array. But if you do copy an array of objects, just know that the objects are shared between the two arrays. JavaScript has the ability to transform an array into a string. And I use that term transform very loosely because the methods that we talk about typically don't change the array itself. It leaves the array alone. Instead, it simply returns a new value. So like the slice method that we talked about in the previous lesson, it did not change the existing array. It just created a new array. Well, the method that we will talk about in this lesson is called join, and it will join the individual elements of an array into a single string. So if we don't pass anything to the join method, it is going to separate each one of the elements with a comma. So let's see what this looks like. We will retrieve the elements with the ID of list, and then let's set the inner HTML to our new HTML. So this HTML variable is going to contain the text of bacon, eggs, butter, milk, and bread. And of course, everything is separated with a comma. But we can change that by passing anything to the join method. I say anything. Whatever we pass to the join method is what is going to separate the individual elements. So if we pass in an empty string, well, then we're going to get a, a string of all of those words just combined together. That's not very useful. At least in our case, I could see where that would be useful in other cases. But that's not very readable to the user. Now, of course, a comma-separated list is somewhat readable. But let's do this. Let's 
separate each element with a breaking line so that then every element is on its own line. That's much easier to read. And that is essentially it. Transforming an array into a string is as easy as calling the join method. All you have to do is specify whatever you want to separate the elements, and that's it. It really doesn't get any easier than that. Transforming an array into another array is a very, very common thing, especially if you start using some very popular UI frameworks like React. Now, I use that term transform, and that's really not the right term to use here, because it makes you think that we are changing or manipulating an existing array, and we aren't. We are creating a new array that contains transformed data. And we do this by using a method called map. So here's what we want to do. In the past, when we talked about the loops, such as the for of loop, uh, the while loop, for loop, and the for each method, we created li elements using our breakfast food information, and we displayed those li elements in the browser. We're going to do the same thing, but now we are going to use the map method, which is arguably the correct way of going about doing this. So we will call map, and we need to pass a callback function that is going to execute on each item within our list, and it is going to output the li element that contains all of the information that we need. So we need our function that will work with the individual item. And let's go ahead and destructure our item so that we have access to text, cost, and the need properties. And to start with, let's just return an li element that has the text, and we will go from there. So what the map method is going to do is execute this callback function on every element. And it's going to create a new array that will contain this transformed data. So let's just write this out to the console so that you can see what the end result is. So let's do that. Let's open up the console in the browser. Let's refresh. And here we have an array of five elements, but you can see that the text is here. These are li elements that contain bacon, eggs, butter, milk, and bread. So we now have a transformed array that has the data that we need to display within the browser. However, we need to convert this array of strings into a single string so that we can easily add that to our list within the browser. Well, we already know how to do that because in the previous lesson, we talked about the join method. That's how we converted an array into a string. So we can take our list elements and we can join them together with an empty string and we are going to end up with our list of things, bacon, eggs, butter, milk, and bread. Perfect. So let's include the cost so that we can see that information. And whenever we view this in the browser, we see the cost as well. So now let's incorporate the need property. And let's say that if an item is needed, then we will simply return that li element. But if it's not, then we will return just an empty string. Because remember that we need to return a value here. This callback function is responsible for transforming each individual element into whatever it is that we want. So if the item is needed, we want the li element. If it's not needed, we don't need to display that in the list, so we will just have an empty string. Because ultimately it doesn't matter, because once we join the elements together and set the inner HTML, all of those empty spaces aren't going to be rendered within the browser. So let's refresh now, and we can see that we have bacon, eggs, and bread, because those are the only items that we actually need. But we can do this a different way by using another method called filter, which we will look at in the next lesson. We used the map method to transform our array of objects into an array of strings that contains HTML. And if the item was needed, then of course we have the HTML to display that item in the browser. If it's not needed, we just have an empty string. And while this particular approach works, I don't like it 
because when it comes to the map method, I want to work with only the elements that I need to work with. So for example, the map method only needs to work with the elements that are needed so that it would be great if we could just eliminate the use of that need property so that our method looks like this. And in fact, we could even break this down even further by using the arrow function syntax because I like nice, neat, concise code. And thankfully, we have the ability to filter an array. The method is called filter. Now, once again, I feel like I need to stress this, that the methods that we are talking about do not change our existing array. It simply creates a new array that contains uh, whatever it is that we are doing. So like the map method created a new array with our HTML elements. Well, we have a method called filter, which will filter an array. But again, it doesn't change our existing array. It creates a new array that contains the filtered elements. And this accepts a callback function that will test each element in the array. And if the test is true, that element will be in the new filtered array. If it's false, then it will be left out. So we want only the items that are needed. So let's do this with an arrow function because this is going to be very simple. If the item is needed, well then we want to display that. So right here we have filtered our array of objects into another array that contains only the items that are needed so that whenever we map them, we are working only with those three elements. So in the browser, whenever we refresh, we see the same exact results. That's great. Well, let's change this up a little bit. Let's say that uh, we want the items that we need and we want only the items that cost less than $12. So that's going to filter this down even more. So whenever we refresh this in the browser, we now see eggs and bread. And if we take a look at our data, yes, that is indeed the case. Our eggs are $10. Our bread is $3. Everything else is either too expensive or it is not needed. So by combining the use of multiple methods together, we typically call this chaining methods, we can do some very powerful stuff. Thank you so much for watching this course. It is my hope that by now you have a thorough understanding of how to iterate, sort, search, copy, and manipulate arrays. They play a key part in data manipulation and processing. Not only can we iterate arrays to transform and aggregate data, but we can sort them in whatever order we need to display that data as we see fit. And because arrays are dynamic, we can easily add, remove, and modify elements, allowing for convenient manipulation and updating of data. Arrays are a crucial part of not just JavaScript development, but development in general. They play a major role in many applications and systems. Again, thank you so much for watching this course. Please feel free to contact me through Twitter or the Tuts Plus forums if you have any questions. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. We have a lot more where this came from. Once again, I am Jeremy McPeak with Envato Tuts Plus. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.